Hello and welcome to Western Civ. In today's bonus author interview, I sit down with historian Peter Saras and we discuss his newest book on Justinian. It really is an all-encompassing historical biography. It touches on every aspect of Justinian's life and his impact on the Byzantine Empire. There's whole sections on, of course, military affairs, Belisarius, the Sassanid Persian Empire, and the reconquest of the West. There's also lengthy discussions of domestic policy, specifically Justinian's involvement in theology, which is a fascinating topic in and of itself. Uh, the historian discusses the rise of Hagia Sophia and the church and the mir miracle that that was in terms of its construction. There's something in this book for everyone. I know a lot of my listeners are avid Roman history fans, and so this is going to be right up your alley. Now, the book is several hundred pages long, so we do not have time to get to everything. I tried to touch on what I felt were some of the most interesting highlights and also some of the more interesting historical what-ifs. But if you're interested in more information about Justinian, go ahead and click the link in the show notes to purchase the book. You will not be disappointed. And so, without further ado, here's the interview. All right, welcome back. So as I mentioned a moment ago, I'm sitting down with historian Peter Saris, and we're talking about his most recent book, Justinian, Emperor, Soldier, Saint. And I think the title really kind of summarizes to a large extent what is a, a fantastic book and the complex personality that is the Emperor Justinian. You know, when I uh, was an undergrad, I took a course on Byzantine history, and it, we discussed Justinian, but it focused almost entirely on military exploits, particularly his efforts to reconquer the West. Um, and then when I was in law school, I took a history of law course, and it focused on Justinian, but Justinian, in that case, the lawgiver, Justinian, the code maker, Justinian, um, one of the forerunners of early modern jurisprudence. And so it's interesting to think about him in a lot of different ways. Uh, but to start the conversation here, I, I think we should frame ourselves and remind the listeners of what the Byzantine Roman, because they would have called themselves Roman, world looked like at the turn of the 6th century. So we're in 6th century CE, and that's the time that Justinian comes to power. And so what, what would the you know, Eastern Mediterranean and generally, you know, European situation would have looked like at the turn of that sixth century. Yeah, from the perspective of Constantinople, uh, really at the start of the sixth century, uh, the East Roman Empire ruled from Constantinople was in what I would think of as a sort of position of ambivalent strength. Uh, on the one hand, it was still one of the two great superpowers of Western Eurasia, alongside its great rival, the Sasanian Empire of Persia. Uh, from his seat in Constantinople, the emperor had a sway extending over still Greece, past the Balkans, Anatolia, Asia Minor, Syria, uh, uh, Palestine, and Egypt, particularly important given it's the sort of the economic powerhouse of the Mediterranean. But beyond that, in a sort of geopolitical sense, there are two great challenges which are really, I think, playing upon people's minds in Constantinople at the start of the century and just prior to Justinian coming to power. The first is that over the course of the 5th century, the Western Roman Empire had gradually disappeared. And we have the emergence of a series of independent Romano-Germanic successor kingdoms under primarily barbarian rulers. Now, some of these rulers would still acknowledge some sort of lo loose uh, overlordship emanating from Constantinople, but others certainly wouldn't and openly reject uh, Constantinopolitan political claims. So you have an emperor in Constantinople who is claiming universal authority, but that universal authority is manifestly con contested by the facts on the ground, and core sectors of the Mediterranean coastline are now under barbarian domination and core territories of the empire, Italy, North Africa, Spain, Gaul in particular. So that's the, the, those are the challenges from the West. 
To the east, one factor that had enabled the Eastern Roman Empire to surmount the crisis of the 5th century was that they had been able, the authorities there had been able to negotiate a detente with the Sasanian Empire of Persia. Both the Persians and the East Romans uh, face a common foe in the Huns, and so they cooperate against the Huns with one another. At the start of the 6th century, that peace with Persia suddenly breaks down when the Persian Shah Kavad launches what the Romans perceive to be a completely unprovoked attack on Roman territory in Syria. And getting the Persians out of Syria requires a massive mobilisation of manpower and resources. So you have this growing sense of insecurity in Constantinople resulting from an awareness that Roman power in the West is no more. And now this intense sense of insecurity across the lands of the Near East, which also plays into political conditions in Constantinople because many members of the Senate there own estates in the East. So I think you have this sort of uh, this paradoxical position of what is still a great power. Its economy is booming. Its, uh, its population is rising. Cities are growing. Commerce is thriving. But in political terms, it feels increasingly constrained and challenged. Yeah, and I think one of the things that is always interesting about this era is that coming so close on the heels of the collapse of the West, you know, there's has to be a question in the minds of a lot of people of, is this a temporary situation? Is this a temporary reprieve for some Western territories, or is the Western Roman Empire gone forever? And um, the other thing worth pointing out here is, of course, just to remind the people who are listening at home that we are talking about a, a geopolitical situation prior to the rise of Islam. Um, So just bear that in mind as we're going forward here, that that is going to be a major shakeup that does come in the future, but postdates Justinian. Now, getting to Justinian more specifically for a second, he isn't someone that you would expect um, to come to power, certainly not in his early formative years. Um, and the way that he does come to power is is kind of interesting um, and leads to some interesting historical what-ifs. So I was hoping you could kind of walk through a little bit of Justinian's background, his family, and how does he wind up being in this position of becoming arguably uh, one of the most powerful men in the world? Yeah, so I think we have to, to wind back a bit um, uh, to the middle of the 5th century. Justinian uh, is born around the year 482, but we need to go back a little bit before that. So Justinian and his family really come from the region to the sort of south or southwest of the city of uh, Nish, Roman city of Naissus, in what's now sort of southern uh, Serbia. And Justinian would later found a, a city near the village where he claimed to have been Uh, born, the remains of which you can still see. Now, in the mid to late 5th century, this was really the empire's sort of wild west. Uh, as a zone which had been subjected to massive military insecurity in the middle years of the 5th century, subjected to Hunnic attacks and attacks by Goths, uh, which clearly did enormous damage to the local infrastructure. At the time when Around the middle of the 5th century, this is probably a region where it's not clear who's in control. The Romans are claiming it. Other barbarian groups are claiming it. It's probably a sort of no man's land where no one group is in uh, total control, but where poverty is endemic, disruption has been massive. Now, uh, Justin's, Justinian's family are basically peasants, it would appear, from the region uh, around uh, to the south of, of Nis, Nisius. His uncle, and really the rise of the family begins with his uncle, Justin, who a later source tells us as a young man is a swineherd. Now, uh, as with a lot of impoverished but ambitious young men, uh, the young Justin wants out of the situation he finds himself. And probably around the year 470, he and a couple of friends of his decide to head to Constantinople. They go there on foot, in the hope of bettering their fortunes by joining uh, the Imperial Army. Once in Constantinople, Justin is extraordinarily lucky in that he arrives at a moment when the authorities are overhauling the arrangements for the palace guard. Uh, Justin, we're told, is a striking appearance. He's tall. He's good looking. He's what you want standing outside the palace advertising imperial power. So he he gets uh, recruited into the new uh, guards unit in the palace. So this suddenly projects this swineherd from the Balkans into the centre of imperial power in the greatest city in the known world. 
Justin is clearly a man of some talent. He rises up through the ranks, and by the time he's in his 60s, he's head of the Palace Guard, and he's acquired an education of sorts through the army. He has a great career. Uh, he marries a loving wife, but they don't have kids. Uh, and so at some point, uh, it's probably, I would say, about 490, uh, 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 Justin writes to his sister back home, suggesting that she sent her son to Constantinople to be raised by Justin. And, and she does this. I think the boy is probably about eight. And his name is Petrus. Uh, once in Constant, And this will be our Justinian, because once in Constantinople, Justin will give this boy an education. He will adopt him, giving him the name Petrus Justinianus, where we get our Justinian from. And he, as I say, and he then uh, uh, arranges for this boy to be recruited into the palace guards himself. So we have, as it were, a career that opens up to Justin, Justinian by virtue of Justin's childlessness. Phase one. Phase two, around the year 518, in the year 518, the Emperor Anastasius is ailing and then dies. But he hasn't made arrangements for his succession. And there's a, a struggle for power at the palace court. Uh, and finally, it's a, no one can agree on any, between any of the obvious candidates. So they agree on Justin to be made emperor as a sort of a compromise candidate in the expectation he won't be around for much longer. He's in his late 60s now. So Justin becomes emperor. And that extraordinary step then opens the way for Justinian. Now, Justin doesn't initially as it were, uh, 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 appoint Justinian to very high office. But he gives the young man a stage on which to advance himself. And from that moment on, from the moment Justin is emperor, we see Justinian starting to try to prepare the way for his own rise to power. Sidelining opponents, having at least one assassinated, it would appear. I'm reaching out for allies in the church, on the streets of Constantinople, through the circus factions, which are like sports supporters clubs, reaching out for allies at court. And progressively, he manages to persuade his uncle to appoint him to higher and higher rank, until really by the time Justin is drawing towards his death, Justinian has managed to get himself uh, set in place as the heir apparent. So it's a series of strokes of good fortune for the family and Justinian, matched with and matched by very careful preparation and politicking on Justinian's part once his uh, uncle or father has become emperor. Yeah, it's really interesting. One of the things that I find fascinating about um, both Roman history and Byzantine history is by looking at the individual emperors, and there there seems to me oftentimes, and I'm certainly not the only person who's ever argued this, that there's a great distinction in quality of emperors oftentimes between those who have to do something to obtain their position and those who are, quote unquote, born to the purple. Um, and it, I wanted, I love that story and it's important because I want to point out that even though Justinian does succeed. Justin, he doesn't have to, sure, he doesn't have to conquer the empire, he doesn't have to win a civil war, but by no stretch of the imagination um, was he, is, no, by no stretch of the imagination is he Commodus, okay? By no stretch of the imagination is he sort of just born to this and this is something he's going to get. And that kind of brings me to my next question, which is an impossible question to answer, and I concede that at the outset. But it's a question that just comes up all the time. You know, whether whenever we're talking about pre-modern individuals, people want to know, well, well, what were they like? You know, what was what was their personality like? You know, how did how did they behave? And uh, of course, we don't have any tweets from Justinian. Uh, we don't have any. I suppose they're not called tweets anymore. Sorry, um, we don't have any. Um, we don't have any video of him. But you know, we. I think we can discern something of his personality. So I was hoping you could tell us, you know, as much as you can, you know, what do we think Justinian was like as a person and as an emperor? Yeah, and fortunately, because he leaves so much legal material behind uh, in his own voice, and you know, we have reason to believe that bits of it are genuinely penned by the emperor, and we have theological tracts by him, and we have accounts of him from written by people who are close close to the centre of imperial power, we can actually come away unusually with Justinian, uh, uh, with an emperor, we come away with the sense of an emperor whose personality really does come across from the sources quite consistently. Um, in particular, he's clearly a workaholic. Uh, 
Um, uh, uh, he tells us that he works deep into the night, night and his critics confirm this. He has a constant urge to micromanage when we look at legislation that's emerging from his court, it goes into the finest of detail on the levels of remuneration and command structures on the very distant fringes of empires. He's sometimes been compared uh, with Stalin, compared to Stalin, and and, it's, and that comparison is largely to do with this, this, this obsession with micromanagement. Uh, he has a, a fiery temper, and we see him uh, losing his rag on a number of occasions, even with quite high-ranking holy men and priests. He has a very uh, prickly sense of his own dignity, which is partly informed by the fact that, as you alluded to, okay, he, he is the son of someone who's become emperor, but the family's background is quite... Uh, 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 obscure. They're from quite a, uh, an insignificant background. Surrounding him at court are lots of members of very prestigious Roman senatorial families. And his sense of his own dignity and his sense his um, uh, uh, sensitivity to being slighted is, I think, sharpened by that. He's constantly in a hurry. When, whether he's writing to the Pope about theology or to his architects about constructions or to his, uh, 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 his legal team about legal reform, he's constantly saying, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Um, and then in terms of his own mindset, one thing that is a, a uniting thread from prior to when he becomes emperor all the way to his dying days is he is fascinated by theology and obsessed with Christian doctrine in a way that's really very unusual. Uh, and we, as I say, we can trace this long before his emperor. So when he is really just a guards officer at court, the nephew or adopted son of an emperor, but still not yet holding very high position, we see him writing to the Pope in Rome, trying to engage him in detailed doctrinal discussion. Now, this would have come across very strangely in Rome, and is very unusual. So I think that really gives us uh, an interesting insight into him. He has a romantic streak uh, in that, rather like his uncle, he uh, marries a wife, it would appear, the Empress Theodora, uh, really, it's only explicable in terms of a love match. I mean, it, she is a very lowly background herself, and he could have acquired a, a much posher wife from court circles who would have been much more politically useful had he... Uh, uh, wanted to. And there were flashes of a sense of humour. I think I found one joke in the entirety of his legislation. It's a very loyally joke, but you know, we don't have, I'm not aware of many other jokes from Byzantine emperors. Um, as a ruler, he has enormous difficulty letting go or delegating responsibility. And perhaps tied into that, he has a, t a tendency to exhaust those he works with. Um, I said, it was driven on by a very strong sense of moral purpose, which ties in to the theological interests as well. Yeah, when I picture the emperor Justinian, I, I oftentimes picture someone. I mean, there's there's the famous mosaic from Ravenna, which is probably the image that just about everybody has when they think about Justinian. Um, but I, I imagine someone meetings all day and then wandering the halls of the palace unable to sleep at night, consumed by thoughts of things going on in distant reaches of the empire. And it's, it, it is remarkable the, the level of micromanaging that he attempts. Be, and I say attempts because, you know, we are, you know, this is the classical age, you know, a message travels as fast as a horse can ride or as fast as a ship can sail. So circumstances oftentimes may have changed dramatically by the time the message goes from wherever to Constantinople and then from Constantinople back. Um, so to think that you're going to be able to send relevant orders is, is kind of an interesting theory um, for, for him to think. Um, but I want to then ask a little bit about, you, you talked about this, about um, the rise of Sassanid Persia. Well, not the rise, but, you know, the, the breakdown of peaceful relations between, you know, the Roman Empire slash Byzantine Empire and the Sassanids at the start of the 6th century. Um, and Rome always has done typically well. Um, when it has peaceful relations with whatever permutation of the Persian Empire it happens to be dealing with, whether it's the Parthians, the Sassanids, so on and so forth, and tends to struggle more um, when it has to engage in military affairs. And I, I think to an extent that's because, you know, they're the only two quasi 
modern states. Um, they're the only two states capable of marshalling the resources to engage in lengthy wars of conquest. Yeah, I mean, you've got you know different tribal entities. You've got the Avars, you've got the Huns, who might from time to time strike in, but you're not necessarily concerned that they're going to take large swaths of territory and hold it. Uh, that's not the case with Persia. You might legitimately lose Antioch and not be able to get it back. So it's a big, big, big problem. Um, what does Justinian do as a way to try to confront this rising threat that's, I suppose, reignited in the East? Yeah, I think this is one of those areas where, um, because the breakdown in relation to Persia predates Justinian's rise to power, one arguably has the highest degree of continuity between his reign and those of his immediate predecessors, not just his uncle uh, Justin, but also Anastasius before him, under whom the war with Persia has re-erupted. So uh, broadly speaking, one distinguishes between the direct frontier zone between the East Roman Empire and Persia. That's essentially the frontier between modern Syria and Iraq, to all intents and purposes. Uh, and then the, the zones that are butted to north and south, Arabia and the Caucasus. In that direct frontier zone, Justinian follows in the footsteps of his predecessors in a massive program of investment in the defensive infrastructure of those eastern frontiers, uh, of that eastern frontier, uh, trying to achieve a measure of sort of defence in depth, trying to limit the damage that any marauding Persian foe can inflict if they break through into Roman territory. That's very much continuity. Along the, 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 the desert frontier, the problem the Romans have is that their desert frontier is, is very extensive and largely undefended, and so very prone to uh, uh, the Persians striking across the desert zone. So there, Justinian affects uh, the, uh, 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 the uh, creation of a pro-Roman Arab tribal confederacy known as the Jaffnids, who he will build up as agents of imperial influence in the region to try to block any uh, ability on the part of the Persians to strike from that direction with their Arab allies, the Nazarids. This struggle for power between these two, power, uh, these two powers in Arabia will start to have increasingly pronounced uh, consequences in the Arabian world itself, leading to much greater state formation and military development there, which is important for the background to Islam. Then heading north in the Caucasus, this is where in many ways the strategic interests of the two empires most clash. Uh, uh, uh. Here we see Justinian uh, crucially creating a new command structure, creating a new field army under a new general to take command of warfare in the Caucasus. We see him trying to use Christianity to uh, extend uh, imperial influence in the region. And also as Christianity is used to meet as a means of sort of cultural imperialism in the Caucasian zone, and as people are drawn towards Constantinople that way, he also seeks to impose much more direct rule on those Caucasian territories where the Romans managed to get a toehold. He tries to more fully integrate Armenian territories. He tries to impose direct rule on other frontier ones. So we have this combination of uh, military uh, tactics, diplomatic tactics, fortifications, but also in terms of diplomacy, especially later in his reign, he will really play upon a key feature of the Sasanian Empire. The Sasanians perceive themselves to be massively vulnerable to attack from the world of the Eurasian steppe that stretches out east towards China. Uh, Hunnic attacks in the in preceding centuries had done massive harm to the Sasanians. So every time the Persians appear to be under pressure from a nomadic foe, Justinian intervenes to try to extract greater concessions from the Persians. And, and we see him deploying that strategy, uh, I say, particularly at the end of his reign, but it is a theme throughout when he engages with the great superpower rival to the east. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, a lot of times... You know, I'll listen to people who are very critical of the Byzantine Empire, and I'm just going to use that term for just to draw a distinction between that and the unified Roman Empire for the purposes of right now, who are very, very critical of the Byzantine Empire for being, oh, they're too diplomatic, as opposed to, you know, your, the power of the, of the Roman legions, you know, marching across the world, which I think that ignores a couple of things. First of all, war is uncertain. Um, you know, there's, there's no indication that if you go to battle that you're going to win, especially with an evenly matched opponent. And so Second of all, um, let's just face it, wars are kind of expensive um, and diplomacy is a lot cheaper 
and it's a lot cheaper to get someone else to fight your war for you if you can't. Certainly, as you point out, um, Justinian's intervention with the tribal peoples of the Arabian Peninsula is going to... um, to some extent facilitate the Arab explosion of military expansion that's going to come later on, but he didn't know that at the time. And I'm not going to sit here and Monday morning quarterback him from thousands of years ago. I don't think that's but worth anything. On the, on the, the very important point you just, you just raised about the, uh, the substance, I think Justinian is perfectly willing when, when he deems it appropriate to buy peace with Persia through massive diplomatic subsidies. And there is an interesting correlation I've spotted before in the 6th century, whereby, because Justinian is, in terms of his career structure, a military man, he's in the palace guards, that's the sort of the mindset he's, 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 he's inculcated with. In general terms, it tends to be in the 6th and 7th centuries, Roman emperors or Byzantine emperors of military background who are most willing to pay for peace. It's the civilian emperors whose, as it were, political base are most anxious about their tax money being given away to barbarians, who are most inclined to be aggressive on that front and to prefer war over diplomatic subsidies. Uh, and that's a very interesting correlation, and Justinian very much uh, fits into that, uh, that model. Uh, as you say, the military have a great appreciation of the dangers of war once it kicks off. Yeah, I mean, it's true. It's it's also true. I mean, if you even want to look at more modern history of um, most of, most American presidents who have engaged in in most of the major conflicts are not the military presidents. Um, they're they're not. Um, they're they tend to be the civilian presidents. So it is interesting that, and I think that that's that is a theme that kind of runs throughout much of history is that people who have engaged in combat are much less willing. Uh, uh, to roll the dice on other people's lives than those who have not, um, which I suppose makes sense from just a practical standpoint. Um, but and, and not to jump around a bit, but I want to make sure that we do cover all aspects of Justinian. So I want to ask about the law code for a moment because his roles as a lawmaker it, are really unprecedented in a lot of ways um, and incredibly dramatic. And uh, I wonder if maybe if you want to look at, you know, long term contributions to society, if maybe this isn't the most important contribution that Justinian um, bequeaths to sort of the Western world is this this incredible law revision that he undertakes. So I wondered if you could talk about that, about what what is he seeking to accomplish by this and just how big of a project are we talking about here? There are two aspects to Justinian as a lawgiver, which we have to think about, both of which are very important, and they're interconnected. First of all, Justinian as codifier. Now, when he comes to power, the problem is there's just so much legal material in circulation that it's very hard to work out what the law on any given situation is. And this is a recipe for chaos. Uh, And really, the reason for this is that Roman law has has an is inherited by Justinian, has different sources of law and different sources of legal authority. So you have laws issued by emperors, but you also have in circulation extensive uh, legal writings by legal scholars from earlier centuries, which can be cited in court and in interpretation. Now, an effort had been made earlier in the 5th century to impose some order on laws issued by emperors. Uh, And you have the collation of the so-called Theodosian Code in the early 5th century. But since then, many more laws have been issued by the subsequent emperors. So again, that problem has returned. There's just a lot of legal enactments. Sometimes they're contradictory. How do you decide between which laws? An attempt had also been made to try to give priority to some legal scholars and their writings over others. But even in terms of those given precedents, you're still talking about, you know, sort of around three million lines of Latin text or 2000 volumes. So this is a huge mass of material for people to try to marshal when deciding the law. Now, Justinian decides very early on in his reign to impose order on this situation and to edit and boil down these legal texts so as to express a single unified opinion and will presented as that of Justinian. And it's a sign of how successful he and his commissioners are that it's almost impossible for us to really work out in any detail now what Roman law was like before they got to work because they're so good at, as it were, airbrushing out what they don't approve of. Uh, so we have, first of all, the uh, order, 528, a year after he comes to power, to issue his own codex, replacing the Theodosian Code, uh, in, uh, uh, reforming all the inherited legislation issued by emperors uh, uh, to express a single unified will and, and model, as it were. 
removing contradictions and what have you. That initially completed by 529, although there's signs that his law commissioners have done it in too much of a hurry because he's been urging them on too aggressively, and they end up having to produce a second version in 534. But then more extraordinarily, he does try something which no one had ever tried before, which was to impose order on this swirling mass of juristic opinions written by the the legal scholars, the so-called jurist consorts. Uh, And in an extraordinary uh, 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 programme between 530 and 533, his law commissioners go through these inherited legal texts and reduce them by 95% to create this extraordinarily condensed version of Roman legal thinking, which can be used more readily alongside the laws of the Codex. Now, it's still a massive work when it emerges. I mean, Justinian's Digest is still one and a half times the size of the Bible, uh, but it's an extraordinary achievement. And Justinian tells us when he started giving instructions that it be put into effect, the, the, the compilation of the Digest, many said it was impossible. Others say it would take 10 years. His law commissioners get it done in three. At the same time, they also produce a new legal textbook, the Institutes, which is like a map of the law, showing how these different bits of the law and uh, Roman law as a system cohere uh, and operate. So that's the codification, and that is the form then in which Roman law will be received by subsequent European societies. And really, it's the common law of Europe until Napoleon issues his own code in the 19th century. But at the same time, he's also issuing an enormous amount of legislation himself. And once again, here we see his uh, his real interest in the law long before he comes across his chief legal officer, Tribonian, who he relies upon for the codification to a great extent. And we see this from the fact, for example, that, you know, Justin... The first, his uncle, wasn't a lazy administrator or a lazy emperor, but we have this period of five months during which Justinian is co-emperor alongside Justin, because Justin is, um, is, is now ailing. And it is a remarkable fact that a third of all the laws we have from Justin's reign are issued during those five months when Justinian has managed to get himself alongside him uh, in, in power. In his eight and a half year reign, we, for his eight and a half year reign, we have about 30 laws that survived from Justin uh, as emperor. For the first eight years of Justinian's reign, we have over 400. I mean, the, the pace of legislation just skyrockets. And we see him intervening on almost every aspect of life as lived in Roman society at this time. He's codifying the Roman law of marriage. He's Christianizing it. Every aspect really is addressed. And he starts to push Roman legal thinking in fundamentally new directions, which are also going to lay the foundations for really Byzantine law, which has very different conceptions of things like the family, for example, as compared to classical Roman law. And this is something emerging from Justinian's court during this extraordinary period of legal activism. Yeah, this, it's interesting as as you're talking, you know, I <laughs> I don't want to like no, I don't want to call other like previous Roman emperors or Byzantine emperors lazy, but certainly by comparison to Justinian, um most people look like, oh, what what are you doing taking Saturdays and Sundays off?" You know, he's he works non-stop and this is the sort of project that only somebody who has this level of sort of dedication to the state and to statecraft is going to be able to undertake. Um, And it's just, if you take nothing else away from this conversation today, just remember that when you think about European common law and to an extent American common law, because of course we adopt English common law as well, you know, it forms the basis, it comes from Justinian. Justinian, like you say, we don't really have a, a sense of what Roman law was prior to this point because of the massive reorganization and restructuring and to an extent streamlining of everything that we have. I mean, that's a huge takeaway. Um, Another one that I want to ask about is Hagia Sophia, which of course, um, the massive church constructed net today, of course, it's a mosque. I think it's actually a museum um, or maybe it's a mosque. I can't. Oh, it's a mosque again. Okay, thank you. Um, I I know that it had gone um, both ways. So, uh, but I think it's, you know, to, To understand what someone would have experienced in the 
6th century visiting this site, I think is just almost mind-blowing. You write the book, it's nothing less than miraculous, the construction of this building. Um, and I wanted you to break that down for a second, because I think after reading that, your chapter or your section of the book on the Hagia Sophia, I came away with that exact same word, miraculous. This is nothing less than a miracle. Um, and I think people in that time period would have seen it that way too. So what what is it that makes the construction of Hagia Sophia so miraculous? Well, I think for those worshipping within it, and this is something very hard to uh, really appreciate when you go and visit the modern, well, the building in its current state, not the modern building, in its current state, uh, due to the number of windows and what have you that have been blocked out, is that the Hagia Sophia, as reconstructed by Justinian after the, the, the Nica riots, is an extraordinary combination of of acoustic engineering and lighting engineering, uh, uh, and uh, um, as it were, it, it, it attempts to, to create a total sensory experience for the worshipper. And we've become more and more uh, aware of this thanks to fantastic work being done by acoustic engineers and also by musicologists, such as the group who perform in the US a lot, Capella Romana, have done amazing work reconstructing the liturgy of the great church at its heights. And when you, you draw these things together, you get a, a real sense of the very careful, the extraordinary evocation of the numinous, which the authorities are aiming at and which they achieve, because even Justinian's critics like Procopius emphasize this. Then beyond that, in terms of how people would have understood it as a sort of miraculous structure, I think you know, you've, you've touched upon the two crucial ones. It is the extraordinary speed with which it, with which it is constructed to start off with. I mean, uh, it's destroyed during the Nike, the old Hagia Sophia is destroyed during the Nike riots of January 532. The new Hagia Sophia is uh, formally inaugurated barely five years later, December 537. Now, you compare that to the, the length of time it would take to build medie medieval cathedrals in the West, and you get a sense of how staggering that is. It's a gargantuan mobilisation of manpower and resources. Later, Byzantine observers would assume that it was the work of a miracle, that Justin had been given the design by an angel. They claimed that 10,000 workmen were required and that it cost the equivalent of a year's tax revenues from Egypt. Now, those aren't necessarily real figures, but they're giving you a sense of how uh, Byzantines understood the scale of the project. The speed is something really worth emphasizing though because in order to construct it Justinian has to ransack the cities of the Near East to get the building materials which is why actually it's a bit hodgepodge inside uh, you know some you know not all the columns are the same length and some have had to be sort of doubled up and what have you it's uh you can see once again Justinian's always in a hurry and you see that actually in the internal construction of Hagia Sophia but its scale is also exceptional. I mean, it, it, the internal height of it uh, beneath the central dome is equivalent to a 15-storey building. It would be the largest domed construction anywhere in the world until the 16th century. And it is domed. I mean, no Roman emperor had ever attempted to build a domed structure on this scale. And this really clearly pushes his engineers to the absolute limits of their, their knowledge and their technical capacity. And once again, I think both in, the, in his architecture and to some extent in his lawmaking and in some of his military endeavours, I mean, he, he, he really pushes those under him to the, to the maximum, sometimes up to and just beyond what they're really capable of. Yeah, and at the speed, by the way, for those who want me to put this into context for you for a second, and some of this is a little hyperbole, but, you know, Notre Dame took about 200 years, you know, if you want to go from beginning to end by comparison to five for this. It's, and I mean, if you want to talk about miracle, yeah, I mean, it would seem like it would be conceivable for someone in the military, um, perhaps a noble, to be away from the city for five years and come back, and it's done. Um, and that, I mean, that in terms of pre-modern building capacity, that's unheard of. That's just simply unheard of for a project of this scale and shape. And again, I think gives us an indication of Justinian's personality and his drive to see this project finished, not 20 years from now, right now. I want it done today, and that's when we're going to get it done. 
All right, let's talk about the West because, um, you know, most people, uh, when they think Justinian, are going to think Belisarius and his efforts to reconquer the lost Roman territories in the West. And it starts with North Africa and is kind of shockingly, um, <laughs> I suppose, um, or maybe, maybe surprisingly easily successful. Um, but, you know, to start, you know, what gets Justinian involved in North Africa? Because it would seem like he has plenty on his plate with the Sassanid Empire. Yeah, so so North Africa, just by way of a bit of background, had fallen to the, this group, the Vandals, in the 5th century. Uh, Carthage falls to them in 439. And they establish a very prosperous and very, it would appear, stable kingdom uh, initially. Now, the Romans had last attempted to intervene there in 468 when an imperial fleet had been destroyed by the fire ships of the Vandal king, Geyseric. The Byzantine armada is wiped out. And thereafter, the Byzantine policy is one of positive engagement, really, insofar as they can. But there's, I think, a sense in which the authorities in Constantinople are always minded to intervene in Africa if they get the chance. One reason is because it's so prosperous. So the landscape of North Africa is good for tax revenues if you can get it back. Second, the Vandals have a major fleet, and that can pose a threat to East Roman continuing control of the sea lanes of the central and eastern Mediterranean, uh, uh, should that be a problem. And lastly, the Vandals are uh, followers of a 4th century churchman called Arius, who was regarded as a heretic in Constantinople. Uh, And uh, there are constant reports of the members of the imperial, the so-called Catholic or Orthodox Church, being persecuted at the hands of the Arian Vandal authorities. So you have all these reasons for Byzantium to be minded perhaps to intervene should the opportunity arise. Now, Justinian has um, courted previously the heir to the Vandal throne, a certain Kilderic who had come to power in 523 and under whom the treatment of the Catholic clergy seems to improve and we start seeing a diplomatic tilt back towards Constantinople. But Kilderic is not a very militarily effective king and in these early medieval societies in the West, military effectiveness is the key requirement for good kingship. And eventually, by virtue of his military failings, in 530, he is brought down by his cousin, Gelimer. And we start seeing signs of tension and of this kingdom starting to fragment. The governor of Sardinia casts off Vandal overlordship. There's a revolt by the Romans in Tripoli. So this gives Justinian an opportunity and a pretext to intervene. But interestingly, he doesn't do so then in 530. Instead, the intervention only comes after, first of all, a peace has been negotiated with Persia in 532, and also in the aftermath of the Nica riots, when Justin has almost been deposed from the throne in uh, an outbreak of rioting, which members of the Senate appear to have tried to take advantage of to depose the emperor, his legal activism actually being a source of enormous um, anxiety to them. So I think on one level, the intervention there is driven by both an opportunity provided by political instability in the Vandal Kingdom, combined with now a need to try to rebuild the political credibility of the regime at home by making an opportunistic foray to the West. And so I think that explains the timing of it. And opportunistic is kind of the right word here. Um, in the, Justinian, and we can, we'll talk about this at the end, he can be criticized in these efforts to reconquer parts of the West and that, well, does, does he deplete resources needed to actually counteract Persia in their, the Sassanids in the East um, in order to try to reconquer parts of the empire that cannot really be reincorporated? And But to an extent, if you are looking at where can we be militarily successful for you know the least cost um, certainly the vandal kingdom of north africa looks much more like an easy target compared to the sassanids to the east by a million stretches of the imagination and they prove to be the other thing that is always worth remembering um, is that we have to uh, disabuse ourselves of what we what comes to mind when we picture North Africa right now. Because what we picture North Africa right now would have not been what North Africa was like um, during this time period. It was much more agriculturally productive, much more fertile. Um, it would have been a useful 
portion of the empire to add it back and bring it back into the Roman sphere of influence. Uh, Belisarius is dispatched under, as you as you indicate, um, and is successful um, in winning a pitched battle against the Vandal kingdom and essentially toppling it over. But I always wonder about this because I think sometimes maps can be misleading, especially at certain points. You put this big color on the map and you say, this is Rome and this is not Rome. And so Rome has control over this. But the question that I want to ask is even after North Africa is, I'll say, reincorporated into the Byzantine sphere of influence, brought back into the Roman fold, to what extent is that true? Because I think you do a nice job in the book of sort of outlining, you know, how firm is Roman control once it's reestablished in this area compared to you know, some areas that are much, much closer to Constantinople. The emphasis from the start, and I think this probably gives one a sense of the, of the core strategic objectives, uh, appears to have been very much on controlling the cities of the coastal zone along the Mediterranean uh, coastline and their immediate hinterlands, which were agriculturally extremely productive, and also on controlling the key islands uh, of the Western and Central Mediterranean, which the Vandals had also controlled, such as Sardinia and the Balearics. They're really not that interested in the areas beyond that, the sort of the hinterlands uh, of the old Vandal kingdom, where the Vandals had confronted various uh, bear bear uh, warlords. And so as a result, during the course of both the wars and then the, the, the Roman reoccupation, really we're seeing ongoing bear bear encroachment coming in from the, the tribal zone of Mauritania and Numidia uh, beyond. But the, the main focus is on the most taxable territory, the coastal territory, and the islands are crucial for pinning down once more control of the Mediterranean. It's also worth emphasising that, as you say, that really uh, uh, the, the, it's the, the, the defeat of the Vandal kingdom, it really centres on the defeat in battle, then ultimately the capture of the Vandal king. In the early medieval West, you see the emergence of these sort of king-focused societies, where if you can capture the king, in a political sense, you have the kingdom. As we see, most obviously, the best example would be what happens to England in 1066 with the Normans. Same thing, really, with, with Harold. So, so he's taking advantage of the sort of new dynamics of power that have emerged in the West in order to, uh, uh, to, to, to achieve this result. And then, you know, it goes further. And, you know, Justinian has this... Um I'll say, you know, ace up his sleeve. He's got uh, this general by the name of Belisarius who is unbelievably effective um, in the field, like just just incredible. And in short order, is able to then move from eventually North Africa to Sicily, to Southern Italy, to Rome, and up to Ravenna. And that's just a remarkable sort of... Um, series of military achievements in such a short period of time. And I'm just kind of curious if you could speak to that for a second, because I've always wondered about this military campaign. You know, to what extent was this part of an overarching strategy, or to what extent was this just simply Byzantine opportunism? To what extent was this just, I can't believe we keep winning, but we keep winning easily, so let's just keep rolling the dice. You know, where, where do we end up on that spectrum here? Yes, I think it's. I don't think that Justinian comes to power, as it were, with a plan to reconquer the Western Roman Empire. Uh, there's one moment in one law at the height of ambition in 535 where he raises that prospect, but I think he's probably getting a bit overexcited there. I think what we see is much more piecemeal, much more opportunistic, but his policies in the West are always... Uh, united by a common analysis of power, which is understanding that these kingdoms in the West are always vulnerable when there is a succession dispute or a dispute over the military effectiveness of the ruler. It's this king-focused nature again. Now, the same circum very similar circumstances that had arisen in Africa that opened the way to the Byzantine intervention there then arise in Italy. Uh, the old King Theodoric, who was a fantastic ruler, had died in 526. There hadn't been an adult male heir to succeed him, capable of stepping into Theodoric's war boots. Instead, you have a, a boy king, Athalaric, 
who reigns under the care of his mother, Amala Suntha, a marvellous woman, but she can't lead the army. Uh, and he then dies in 534, just before he's old enough to start to be a militarily effective king. And we then have this struggle for power at the, at the court in Italy, ruled from Ravenna, between Amala Suntha and her cousin Theodahad. Amala Suntha is assassinated, and this now once again opens the way for Justinian's armies led by Belisarius, who he's talent spotted when Belisarius was a, 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 a fighting soldier, uh, 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 to intervene. So the circumstances in terms of the analysis of power are very similar. Belisarius leads his armies into Sicily. Sicily, it's effectively an unopposed campaign. There's not much by way of Gothic garrison troops in Sicily. The Gothic army is concentrated to the north, where you would normally expect Italy to be attacked from. Uh, 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 what then happens uh, as Belisarius crosses onto the mainland is that the Gothic high command sort of goes into meltdown. Uh, the king, Theodahad, who again has no military credentials, is assassinated. Uh, they have a new king, uh, 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 um, uh, Vitigis, Vitigis, who is more militarily effective, but he has to face the problem that Belisarius is advancing into Italy from the south. More Roman forces are also advancing on northern Italy, and the Romans have also mobilised their allies, the Franks, who are also now bearing down on northern Italy. So Vitigis has to choose between trying to hold out in Rome, uh, on which uh, Belisar is advancing, or pulling his men back to consolidate his control of the Ostrogothic heartland, which is the, uh, to be found in the lands to the north of the River Po, around Ravenna, which is the political capital, and the area from which the Goths have always expected any attack to come from the, the world of the north. So really, Belisar is able to enter Rome essentially unopposed, because Vitigis has taken the strategic decision to pull back to Ravenna. Um, once again, the, the authorities playing on the vulnerability of Italy to attack from the north. He's then able, I mean, there's a lot of toing and froing we won't have time to go into here. But then we end up in a situation where by about 539 to 540, Vitigis and his regime is well, holed up in northern Italy, holed up in, in Ravenna. But Justinian is now minded to try to draw the Italian campaign to a close. The Persians are mobilising on the eastern frontier. He really wants Belisarius' services uh, back there again. And uh, Vitigis offers to essentially partition Italy with Justinian, with the Goths maintaining a rump state to the north of the Po, keeping Ravenna, acknowledging uh, Justinian's overlordship, but Justinian having the rest. So Justinian can have Italy, oh, the southern Italy, he can have Rome, he has Sicily. And Justinian seems minded, his ambassadors seem minded to accept this. Uh, the problem is that the ambassadors sent to do this deal, the problem they're faced with is that the Goths expect Belisarius to sign the peace treaty as well. And Belisarius prevaricates. He thinks Justinian can get more out of the situation. This is recorded by his secretary, the historian Procopius, who is with him during these campaigns and is writing his account of it. So, uh, uh, and an extraordinary episode then appears to ensue whereby Belisarius doesn't sign the peace treaty and the Gothic nobility and ultimately King Vitigus himself approach him and say, look, if you cast off Justinian, and make yourself Western Roman Emperor, we'll support you. Justinian, so, uh, sorry, um, uh, 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 Belisarius gives them the impression he's going to go along with this. As a result, the doors of Ravenna, uh, the gates of Ravenna are open to him and his armies, and they are able to occupy the city. And before the Goths know what is happening, their king's been arrested, he's on the ship to Constantinople, and they've handed themselves over to Justinian. It's an extraordinary uh, episode in, 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 in military history. Yeah, it is, it, is, it is interesting because it is a series of events. And it, what Justinian is really good at doing here and what this example shows, um, and also what you brought up previously of taking advantage of whenever the Persians are attacked by one of those steppe peoples, is he's excellent at recognizing when there is the opportunity, when there's the opportunity to intervene, and he doesn't pass those opportunities by. When there is the opportunity, he takes it, and he takes it consistently, and that is sort of the hallmark of a good emperor. But it's it's interesting, yeah. So, and he does the same in the 550s in Spain as well. Again, you get a succession dispute in the Visigothic kingdom in Spain, and lo and behold, his, his army suddenly turn up on the Spanish coastline. Exactly the same circumstances, exactly the same analysis of power at work there in his policy. 
Yeah, and but then of course you know something happens in 541 um, that's going to sort of dit change Justinian's um, fortunes, and that is that from one of the plague foci that are natural in the world, bubonic plague erupts, um, and the plague of Justinian begins, and the plague of Justinian is obviously going to have has a dramatic effect on the latter half of his reign. And so I was hoping, you know, before we get to our last question, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about the plague um, and how it if impacted his overall fortunes. And I, I often wonder, I think there's a historic what if here of, of what happens if the plague doesn't occur. You know, what happens, and I know it's an impossible question, um, is he able to accomplish more? I think obviously the question, the answer to that is probably yes. Um, if the plague doesn't happen, or you know, would the last years have played out in the same sort of fashion? The arrival of bubonic plague, in the, the words of my old um, professor uh, in Oxford, Cyril Mango, was perhaps the most important event of the sixth century. Uh, in the absence of modern medicine, bubonic plague is one of the most devastating diseases known to mankind. And as you say, in 541, we have uh, the first securely datable outbreak of this disease in the history of the Roman Mediterranean. Possibly visited North Africa a few centuries earlier, but this is the first truly trans-regional pandemic of it. It reaches Constantinople in 542, where we're told Justinian himself contracts the disease, but miraculously survives. Uh, it soon is in Armenia, Italy. It even reaches uh, where I am now. So half an hour from the cottage I'm sitting in is an Anglo-Saxon burial site at a place called Edix Hill, where a few years ago we found uh, um, evidence for uh, a mass mortality episode to do with the Justinianic plague there from, again, the mid-6th century. So it's even reaching rural parts of the Anglo-Saxon world. Now, I think that this will have uh, 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 this will cause mounting difficulties for Justinian over the, the the years ahead. Initially, we see him and his um, courtiers introducing a series of crisis driven measures aiming to sort of shore up the fiscal and legal foundations of the Roman state as mass mortality episodes lead to um, problems collecting tax revenues, problems raising troops for the army, um, legal confusion as to who owns what, as so many heirs are dying in quick succession. And those crisis-driven measures, I think, are quite good at initially containing the first uh, ramifications of the plague during the first five years down to about 547. But then we start getting ev mounting evidence for just the cumulative waves of this disease having an ever more severe impact uh, as it takes a, a toll, its toll on the the rural population, the urban population, you have fewer taxpayers. Fewer taxpayers means fewer, uh, less revenue with which to pay the army. Uh, the harder it is to pay the army, the harder it is to fight wars to both east and west. And the problem for Justinian is from the early 540s, you have now simultaneous warfare in the, in the west and against the Persians and an increasingly problematic situation in Africa as well due to bear bear pressure and military mutiny as military pay isn't forthcoming. So I, but, so I think in many ways, uh, as I said, it's going to increasingly constrain the emperor's opportunities in terms of military strategy, internal domestic reform. Uh, uh, but I think above all, I don't, for me, but what I see the Justinianic plague doing primarily is ex exacerbating internal weaknesses and tensions that had long bedeviled the empire. Long before the advent of the plague, during a, uh, his extraordinary legislation of the 530s, Justinian is complaining about the difficulty in raising enough tax revenues. He overhauls the structures of the Roman state to try to pump as much uh, 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 fiscality out of the empire as possible. So the, the tax raising is already a problem. He's already complaining that the costs of warfare make it necessary to really improve the tax collecting mechanisms of empire. The plague now raises those fiscal problems to a new order of reality. And I think that's true of some of the political uh, problems as well. 
Well, and, and listeners are, of course, very aware that, you know, we just recently went through a pandemic of our own. And those sort of existential crises tend to simply reveal existing cracks and exacerbate them. And I think I agree with you that to a large extent, that's what this did. Um, of course, it creates new problems of its own, but any existing problem, it's just going to dump fertilizer on top of. Um, I want to ask, because we're coming up on time, but I want to ask the last question. Um, you posit in the book, I mean, I might not get the quotation correct exactly correct, but um, did Justinian ruin the empire that he set out to restore? Um, and that's, uh, that I think is a, a fascinating question that reasonable people can discuss and maybe even come to different conclusions on. Um, but I want to ask, in your opinion, did he? No. <laughs> um, I think, in short, it's, it's true that in the second half of his reign in particular, and and in the, the centuries of the decades ahead, uh, uh, under his successors, the empire would find mount, face mounting social, uh, mounting uh, difficulties. Uh, in the second half of the sixth century, we have ongoing problems with raising taxes. We have growing fiscal instability. That feeds into growing political instability as later emperors have to try to cut back and expenditures. They try to restrain military pay. And this will lead to military mutinies and civil war, which will then open the way to first Persian uh, and then ultimately uh, Arab conquest. So the empire is clearly getting increasingly fragile and unstable after Justinian's reign. But I don't think we can causally connect that instability to his policy agenda. Really, I think the, the growing travails of the empire in the second half of the sixth century and in the early seventh are really due to um, uh, phenomena which are primarily outside of Justinian's control in any meaningful sense. Uh, uh, the 530s is the period of major climate change then problematizes agriculture in a way that has economic consequences moving forward. We have the devastating outbreak of the bubonic plague, which repeats itself. And it's not a one-hit wonder, as it were. This is, you know, we have major outbreaks going through throughout the, the 6th and, and into the 7th centuries. It only peters out in the 8th century. Um, we have a, a renewed era of instability on the Eurasian steppe that leads to a, the westward migration of a group known as the Avars. As a result of their migration, new barbarian threats will emerge. The Lombards will migrate into Italy, undoing Justinian's reconquest there. Slavs will start infiltrating the Roman position in the Balkans, hollowing out Roman power there. And as I say, in the aftermath of the Roman-Persian Wars, when two, each of these empires are exhausted, the Arabs will arrive. But these are this, this unravelling of the empire that takes place in the early 7th century in particular, I think really uh, is the result of cumulative problems resulting from these great external forces, climate change, uh, plague, migrations, the Justinian sitting in Constantinople for all his claims to universal authority and autocratic omnipotence could never really contain or, 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 or contrast it. Yeah, I, I, I agree. You know, I don't think that, I think it's, unfair for us to assume that Justinian um, has more capabilities than a, the leader of a modern nation state. A modern nation state struggles um, with uh, pandemics. They struggle with climate change. They struggle with huge external um, forces. T to expect Justinian, as you say, and I, I think it's point, correct to point it out again, sitting in Constantinople, I mean, he may in the middle of the plague dispatch a letter to someone that by the time the letter is arrived is dead. Um, and, and there isn't anything that he can do about that. You know, he is still dealing with the technological limitations of his age and trying to get things successful you need to be highly skilled and you have to get a little lucky and it Justinian had good luck to a large extent at the beginning of his reign through the middle and the second half not as much um, and none of that is necessarily his fault um, but anyway well we didn't get to talk about a lot of the book but that's because it's an excellent book and it's very detailed um, I really recommend it I hope that people pick it up um, we didn't talk at all about theology and there's a huge portion of the book that's about that and I know that my listeners are going to be really interested in that so the book is available uh, right now if you're listening to this and um, if you'd like to pick it up you can click the link in the show notes and we'll go from there uh, but thank you so much for coming on this was a wonderful conversation Great to talk to you.